Okay, thanks for coming. We're already in week 11, time flies like an error, I guess. Um, and to continue trying to understand, remember what I, what I tried to tell you kind of last time, uh, was that there is this number associated to a surface. So now that we know the classification of surfaces, we can kind of play around with surfaces a little bit. And there's this number that was a chromatic number of the surface. And what we want to do is we want to put maps on the surface exactly in the same way as you would put maps on the Earth, which is uh, the surface S2. And we are asking this combinatorial question, which is actually quite classical, about how many colors suffice to color the countries such that neighboring countries get different colors. And the question is phrased, well, for each map, you certainly need a certain number of colors, of course. And we are asking the question whether there is some universal number, and that's this chromatic number, such that you can always color all maps with at, at most those many colors. Like um, the four color theorem for well, real world maps on, on the surface of the Earth, so on S2. And we would like to well, play around a little bit and do the same for the torus or the Klein bottle. Whenever you want uh, to draw maps on a Klein bottle, you will get some nice answers. Let me just say here from the outset, it's not really clear why that number should be finite or so why it, it should exist. So maybe you can have comp very complicated maps and you need an arbitrary number of colors eventually to color everything. But it will turn out that there's a closed formula uh, for this number, which is a really amazing formula. It's called Hewitt's formula. We'll see it today. And it essentially only depends on the Euler characteristic of the surface. And by now, I hope I convinced you that the Euler characteristic is pretty cool and very use, uh, useful. And here's another example um, that we will see today why the Euler characteristic is pretty useful. Okay, so goal for today, coloring problems in various forms on various surfaces. Um, so let's go ahead. So last time I had those so this uh, slide was already there last time. I had this, these conditions. Um, the, the first one is just in order to avoid that you have some, something stupid like uh, if you have just vertices of order two, maybe I give my vertices a slightly different color, then they're just around the border of one, one, um, of one country, and that's a bit boring. So we want at least some adjacent countries here. So oh, I should give it a red color. So we would have to at least kind of uh, vertices of order three. Um, the second condition, so let me ignore the second condition for a second. Let me comment on the final three. The final three are just for convenience, because whenever we have one of those situations, the coloring doesn't really change. So if you have uh, countries that are completely surrounded, for example, this might happen, of course, on a real world map. But the point is we just simplify the problem because the, the coloring number will depend on, on this additional uh, little uh, country stuck in between another country. And the first one is maybe a bit confusing, but we actually need it. We will see it uh, in action, so why we need it. Um, why is it confusing? Because it doesn't really happen on, on any real world map. I think mostly because the countries are not big enough, but you can um, easily think of I'll show you an example if we just do it in, in complete generality. So here's a, is a map of uh, countries. There's a whatever, uh, light blue country, there's a red country, and there's a green country. And there's a Möbius strip, as you can see by identifying those edges. Uh, so that's why this country down here is actually also up here, and the red country is down here. And the green one has a border with itself, right? That, that's something we don't want. Uh, this, this doesn't happen on, on real world maps because countries apparently are not big enough. Uh, but if I just draw a random map on the surface, it could happen. And it kind of doesn't really change the coloring problem, so we could just remove that silly edge and just think of uh, just the, the green country itself. So we will actually do that uh, just for convenience. OK, I said again. The first condition is, again, so all of them actually just for convenience, not really a restriction. The first just comes from. <laughs> you can draw very crazy maps. Uh, it doesn't need to correspond to any real world setting. Right? The power of mathematics is always that you kind of generalize some, some real world setting, have a way more general setting, 
And whenever someone comes from the real world, they can just look up their special case and just apply it to their situation. So if countries ever come up with uh, borders with itself, then our theorem uh, kind of still applies because we just took it out for, for convenience. So all of these are just really just for convenience. But it will turn up in the formulas, so just keep that in mind. Okay. And this is just notation again that we will use, so I just put it on the slide. So if you have a map on the surface, there's just vertices, edges, and faces, and I would color the faces. And the most important notions we had here were the average vertex degree, which is just defined, well, the sum of the vertices is twice the number of edges, divide by the number of vertices to get the average vertex degree. Uh, similarly, for the average face degree, which is just delta, either V or S. And by definition, if you just look at the formulas, you will see that uh, this little equation holds. Uh, so this one here, and we will use it several times. The average vertex degree is at least three by first assumption. Um, the uh, average face degree is at most f minus one by the second assumption, I guess. And last time we had this uh, lower bound, upper bound, sorry, upper bound on the face degree depending on essentially only the Euler characteristic of our surface. So here's a little Euler characteristic. And for some funny reason, the number six plays an important role in all of these uh, business. Uh, so that was kind of the setting from last time. And now we really want to get, get going and, and color maps. So last time I just kind of stated a few lemmas at the end because we'll eventually need them. Uh, but coloring maps is much more fun. So I guess we can get going. Um, and the first lemma we will prove won't be very hard. It's the following. It looks very strange, but we will see it. Kind of those numbers come out, uh, the square root of 49 minus 24 times the Euler characteristic. They come out of the formulas, and in the end, we will see them all the time. You don't really need to remember them, but kind of more the overall shape of uh, this equation. So note that this is, is an equation in chi of s. So the only variable here, if you want, is chi of s. And it's an upper bound for uh, the phase degree. And again, let me remind you that in the end, we need to restrict the closed surfaces. So by Mobius for example, Actually, we can't really say much about the Möbius, but projected plane or Klein bottle surface, so, uh, sorry, a surface of the Earth, so S2, they all work pretty well. Lots of funny assumption here that it's not the projective plane. Uh, so this is, by, by now we know that this means it's not the projective plane and not uh, S2, because these are the only surfaces with a, with a positive Euler characteristic. So I could have just written not being um, S2 or the projective plane. So let me just write it again. Let me just actually write it here. So this is not equal, so S not equal to uh, S2 or P2 because these are the only ones with positive order characteristic. Cool. Um, so, so very, very easy uh, arithmetic. There's a minus one missing on the, on the right hand side. But anyway, uh, or sorry, let me just double check here. It was smaller or equal than minus one, so it's actually right. So then it's strictly smaller so than um, the number of f, and you just put it on the other side. Um, and we just put everything together. So we had this, just had it on the last slide. That was the last lemma we proved left last time. The first inequality here is the last lemma, and now you just replace f by what it is, um, so by this equality, and you get the following equality. Still playing around a little bit here. Um, and you just solve. Mm? You just reorder everything. You have a delta f on one side, you have a delta f on the other side. So eventually, you get a quadratic equation in delta f, and this is where the square root comes from. Um, and if I haven't messed up, it should just look like this. So there's no, not really magic going on. Just order the terms and form the quadratic equation in terms of delta f. Okay, so that's a quadratic equation. It's smaller or equal to zero. And, well, really not hard. We do some nice calculus here. 
I just copy it, make it a little bit more readable for you by putting little x's here, but it's really just the same equation. And if you plot it, it looks like this. It's small or equal to, uh, to zero means we're somewhere in the region down here. You can explicitly calculate, of course, the roots of these polynomials, and these are exactly these numbers that show up. These are the roots of the polynomials, so if we want to be somewhere in between those two, uh, this is where um, the upper bound actually comes from. So it's not really magic, I just formed my, my polynomial, so my parabola here, and we want it to be in this region. And it just turns out that the numbers give us those two roots as a solution. So this was a little bit playing with numbers. Um, we're almost done playing with numbers, so there will be some, some real statements uh, in a second. But really, it was just playing a little bit with what we did last time. Uh, nothing really complicated. We just set one to the other to get out. This is slightly strange looking uh, set of roots, but well, it's just what it is. I have not, nothing smart to say about it. It's just this polynomial, and it just has those roots. Uh, so this is a positive one. That's just it. Okay. Turns out that this number is absolutely crucial for everything with coloring, which is very, very funny. Um, but we'll see that in a second. So it really looks kind of random. And sometimes mathematics is just completely random. And here's a strange random number staring at you. 49. Where, where does 49 come from? And 24 times the Euler characteristic and some other constant floating around in the front. But really, I said again, it was just solving a quadratic equation in the end, namely the one here in black. Cool. So let's do that now in an example. Okay, that's what we got. Fine. The average phase degree is low or equal to something. Um, and somewhere I needed, I used my assumptions here, for example, here. So let me just show you. Um, if you just feed in the numbers, the double torus, you remember the Euler characteristic of the double torus was minus 2. Yeah, each whole, uh, each, each so double torus is this beast here, this one handle and another handle. Each, we start with 2, each handle contributes minus 2, so we end up with 2 minus 2 minus 2, which is minus 2 for the Euler character. Okay, the formula gives roughly 7.4. Um, if I have messed up, that's roughly what comes up. So 49 minus 24 minus, times minus 2 square root, blah, 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 whatever. You get 7.4. So the average phase degree of a map on the, tor or the double torus will be roughly, well, will be smaller than 7.4. Um, there you go. Good. That's what the lemma tells us. And if you remember what the double torus was. Uh, the easiest picture, the standard one we had is this one. So the AB, A inverse, B inverse, CD, C inverse, D inverse. And note here that obviously the phase degree is eight, just the number of adjacent edges. It's an eight gun, so phase degree is eight. I, I just claim the phase degree is at most 7.4. Um, that looks a bit like a problematic statement here. So the lemma gave us at most 7.4. Here's an example where the phase degree, the average phase is that's just one phase. So the average phase degree is just the degree of the phase. So the, the average phase degree is 8. So where's the contradiction? Um, well, there's actually no contradiction at all. Let me just, there's another example of a very strange map. It's not a good map. Because this whole, it's just, the torus here is just one country, and it has ex extremely many borders with itself. I we actually don't want that. So we always have finer pictures like this. So the standard polygon decompositions, that's why I had this slide, do not work for our mapping um, assumption. So we always have finer maps. The, the torus is never covered by one, it's kind of, kind of not a big restriction. The torus is never covered by double torus, whatever, by one map. Like on the Earth, you will never find one country that is everything. Um, so if you would make it finer, uh, adding some, some real boundaries here, some, some real country nonsense, I don't know. I don't know, just something random. Then the average phase degree, as you can already see, will be much, much smaller uh, in general. And in fact, it will be lower equal than 
uh, 7.4. So I just did that, first of all, to convince you that that formula is not so bad. To feed in one number, you get out one number. And second point is, the first assumption, the second assumption we had, that no country has bought of itself, rules out our standard polygon. So the same will work kind of for all standard polygons. We always have something finer, like my black picture uh, in the middle, which kind of makes sense, because what we really want is we want the map, we want real maps and not something, something silly. Um, like just one country. So there's no contradiction, although it looks like there's a contradiction. And of course, in the proof, we used this because it was kind of our first assumption. It came out, if that wouldn't be true, then the proof wouldn't work for us. And that's exactly where uh, we are off here by why these two numbers are, are different. Anyway, I said again, essentially what I tried to tell you is that the formula is not bad. It's just formula and you feed in the number and you get out some number. It's actually pretty good. Right? So we know the Euler characteristics anyway and it's just something you compute. Um, and the theorem is, so that, that, that lemma here is a little bit boring. It just says the average phase degree is, but who cares about the average phase degree? Uh, the, the theorem really is that the chromatic number is bounded. So this already tells you that it's not infinite. It's always bounded by uh, those numbers. So the second one is a slight variation of what we just saw. It's seven plus instead of five plus. And the first one, um, we did it last time by hand for those two surfaces. So for some silly reasons, we need to do those two surfaces by hand. And the other one just comes in a closed formula. So it's actually not so bad. So a closed formula that bounds our little friend here. So almost all surfaces, Klein bottle, double torus, uh, something with 500 cross caps, this formula just gives you an upper bound. It turns out that this formula is sharp. So this formula right now gives you just an upper bound um, for the chromatic number, so the maximum number of colors you need for a map. And that's pretty amazing, actually. Formula, as I said, looks a bit strange, but this is pretty amazing. It's a closed formula. It's not very complicated. Uh, and it gives you an upper bound for everything you kind of want. Um, and let me just prove it for you. So the integer part of the right-hand side is just, well, so let me go back here. So because there's a square root, this will usually spit out the non-integer, and you just uh, get rid of the non-integer part. So here the integer part would be seven. Right? Just round down. Okay. So square root always almost always will be uh, not an integer. Just round down. Okay, so we did that last week because the average phase degree uh, was six, uh, at most six by last week. And the average phase degree is at most whatever it was um, for from uh, the, the, the last level. And the rest is number C. And it's always strictly smaller than C because the square root is a little bit bigger and we, we round down. So the only thing we need is that it's strictly smaller um, than kind of either 6 or whatever remains with an integer part on the right hand side. And what we do right now is kind of a fun trick. So I just trace everything together. So C is either 6 or C is the integer part of that nonsense. OK. And now comes the fun. So it's really kind of a cute argument. So let's have a look. So now we have to assume that you have a map on S on our surface. And the CM, remind you, was, so this one was a minimum over all. And this one is the minimal for the given map. Okay. So the minimum over all is what we are up for. And the minimal for a given map is what I'm going to discuss right now. And then we see some examples. And we do it by induction on the number of faces. And the, the, the induction argument is really cute. So it's very simple. I have some nice pictures for you. OK. Um, small cases are easy. That's all I'm saying. If there are not many faces, uh, so if there are no other six faces, well, you at, at most need six colors, obviously, because you can give everything its own color. So that's kind of boring. And that's the, the starting case. Okay, so let's assume it and let's get going. It's kind of a, 
uh, kind of a fall argument. So we assume that the number of faces is bigger than six when now the statement is not uh, trivial. And because the average phase degree is smaller than C, we can assume that there is a phase with degree smaller than C. So we have it somewhere here in our, in our map. That's our phase F. Um, it has at most C, and in this picture is six, at most C adjoint uh, countries. So the degree here is just the number of adjoint countries. So here in this picture, so one, two, three, four, this was supposed to be a four, five, and six. And there's six adjoint countries. And that's a fun, that's a really cool trick, uh, which kind of does everything for you now. You just have this F somewhere, and you know that it's kind of bounded by C because it's kind of the smallest phase you find. So just pick up the smallest phase, and just contract it to a point. So assume that a country is not there. A uh, really cool trick, contract it to a point, right? Just contract all the vertices together to a new point. So um, whatever, the original country here will now be here, or whatever, the red country here will now be here, and so on. The, the face is gone, it just contracted it, and you get a map, another map, I call it A, and that map has by definition <laughs> one fewer face, because you just contracted the face to a point. So we can actually apply induction and color it with a certain number of colors. And maybe you can already see where this is going. I have to then color my map, blow it up again, and I need a certain number of colors for the remaining. Uh, we'll see it in a second. So we color it. So we can apply induction. Very good. So N is my new one. So N is a so this is N. N is this one. This is M. My induction has two fewer faces. Very good. So you can color it with some colors. Some, some green, blue, yellow, red, uh, whatever, uh, pink, I guess, and an, another lightish blue. Um, so we need at most C minus one colors around, around X. By induction. So the face is gone. We color the rest. It's pretty cool trick. I draw a nice picture in a second. The face is gone. We color the rest. And now we just blow off the face again. And we need to fill in some color. And we just pick some color that is different from the ones that is around. Uh, let me see what kind of color I've picked. Oh, purple. Purple is a very nice color. So I picked purple. So that's a color that we haven't seen. Uh, so they're, 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 therefore, you can color the map to see colors because by four, it was C minus one. Okay. Yeah, so what I do is the following trick, and we're done. So it's a pretty cool, cool idea. So what we do is the following. Give me some space. We have some crazy map F, uh, M. Could be very crazy, but notice how it looks like. We look for the, mid, the face with the minimal number of adjacent countries. Uh, could be this one, for example. And you just collapse it, get a new map. Oops, there will be a new map. And it's completely the same outside of a little disk here. So outside of this little disk, it's really just the same. I'm not trying to, no, maybe, maybe I try to draw it again. Uh, this might fail, but anyway, something like this. And in this little disk, the country is now gone, collapsed to a point. We color everything else by induction, so none of the other colors will change here. And then we just fill in the remaining one. And we still need only a certain number of colors. That's a cool idea. You just collapse one face, color everything, and you have reduced an argument which is kind of on the global, on, on the global map to just collapsing one country. So you shouldn't collapse a country, but in this case, so in the real world at least, but in this case, it, it is really, really powerful uh, to collapse the country. So that's what we did, right? And then the new country gets, or the, the, the collapsed country just gets one of the, a new color. It's cute there. It's a really cute proof, actually. So again, you just collapse it, color everything else, the local region, and you blow it up again. Collapse, blow it up. So we get that this one is smaller or equal to, so we get that this one is smaller or equal to, because uh, this holds for any map, so this one is certainly smaller or equal to. So M was just any, any map. Cool. So that was the proof of Hebert's theorem. Um, and it gives us this funny upper bound. Let me go back to the upper bound. 
funny enough, a bond for uh, the chromatic numbers of any surface. That's pretty amazing. It's a pretty amazing theorem. The proof wasn't so hard. There was one main trick, maybe collapse the phase, but the proof then actually wasn't so hard. Again, very amazing. Just one closed formula for all surfaces. Um, it's pretty, pretty amazing. Blah, blah, blah. We had all of this. So let me um, tell you that it's actually better. It's actually even better. So the formula is, is not just an upper bound, it's spot on. So the, the coloring number is given exactly by the formula, by the integer part of the formula. And my notation is just so simple. So this here just means integer part, so round down. So from 7.4, for example, you would just go to 7. So with two exceptions, it's, it's a perfect bound. And the two exceptions are S2, so our Earth, and for some funny, funny numerical coincidence, uh, the Klein bottle actually. Otherwise, the formula is spot on for all surfaces, which is extremely crazy. It's extremely good. Uh, so for all surfaces, there's a formula which only depends on the Euler characteristic and gives you spot on the maximal number of colors you ever need for, any, for all maps on those surfaces. And it's again very, very simple. You just, I mean, you just feed in the number here and you get out something. Uh, pretty simple. Show you some examples now. So the estimate is exactly right, which is, which is absolutely crazy. Uh, so the chromatic number problem, which from the outset looks pretty complicated. You, don't even, you can't even tell whether there's an upper bound left aside for a given crazy surface. How can you decide how many colors a random map needs? You get a closed formula. I mean, this is pretty good. It's actually pretty cool. And all we did is, there was some number nonsense around, but all we did is we played around a little bit with the order characteristic. Again, showing you how actually powerful this order characteristic is. If I haven't said that often enough, I know I sound like a broken record. Always compute the order characteristic, OK? Always do that. Here is another reason why you should. Um, so. To prove this, we already have the upper bound. So the only thing we need to do is we need to, well, by example, give an example of a map that needs that many colors. Then we're done. So we have an upper bound. The upper bound is really the main point. So we need to construct a map which needs uh, C colors. And I will do that at least for some of the surfaces. And it turns out this is an ext extremely fun fun fact in mathematics here, turns out that the easiest surface is actually the, by, by far the hardest one from, from this chromatic number nonsense. So the easiest surface that we eventually really want to study, the surface of the Earth, S2, um, is by far the hardest. And to show that the real CS is actually 4 is it, ridiculously hard. And that's known as a four color theorem. Um, so it's one of the, let me pull it up again in case you haven't seen it, is one of the uh, most celebrated and most popular theorems in mathematics altogether. The four color theorems, the four colors suffice. So here's a post stamp uh, celebrating a math theorem that doesn't really happen really often. It's extremely amazing. Um, and let me give you some history on this. So, why this is so amazing. So, it actually turned up very, very early. So, this are some handwritten notes from I don't know whether I can read it. There's a 5 2 down here. October 29, 5-2. That's almost, so 5-2 is 18-5-2. So I guess it's almost 170 years ago. So 170 years ago, um, this was a conjecture. So someone essentially had the task to color maps. Uh, <laughs> very boring task, I guess. But it came up with this conjecture uh, of, uh, well, if four colors are, are only needed. So I did coloring now for two days in a row because that's, that's what I'm paid for. And I realized I never need more than four. So maybe that's actually conjecture. And uh, wrote this letter to uh, some, a lot of famous mathematicians. And turned out that this problem took about 150 years to be solved. So the proof is really, really hard. Um, it's one of, the, one of the most celebrated theorems. Here you go again. In all of mathematics which makes the above theorem even more impressive because just if you know this, and let's say you would have been a student in the 50s instead of 
Uh, so 70 years ago, when this was still open, and you know this is a very, very famous theorem, because everyone knows it, whatever that means, I would never ever, tr or at least I would never ever tr dare to even try to, to do it for other surfaces, if it's already ridiculously hard for S2. But it turns out that it's easier for everything else. And you get, we just proved it, right? You get this um, upper bound, and it's really not hard. I will do that in a second to write down a few examples of graphs that actually really need this number, uh, sorry, graph maps that really need this number of scholars. Again, this is really crazy. <laughs> it's really a crazy, uh, crazily beautiful theorem. It's a closed formula, and from the outset, like an open question, which is open for, let's say, 170 years, um, <laughs> and you get a closed formula for everything else uh, in a quite a cheap way, just using a little bit of the Euler calculus. And what goes wrong for S2 is that the Euler characteristic argument actually gives us six when the real number is four. So there's something off, and there's something off just reducing it by two is, is really, really hard. And we certainly won't do this in, in this lecture. There's no way I will do it. There's no way anyone will do it in any lecture because the only known proof is a computer verification. Um, so it's essentially still open if you want. Amazing story. So it's extremely amazing. Of course, the four colors here, four colors are fine. Okay. That's exactly what it is, but we just can't, can't show it. So let's see, so all our characters is two, and if you do the calculation, 49 minus 24, so all our characters is two, um, four nine minus uh, four eight, I guess, is square root of one, seven plus square root of one is eight, eight over two is four. But you still, still can't, um, somehow can't do it. And remember, kind of the catch is that we only proved this formula for everything except the sphere. So if we could apply this formula, we would be done, but we can't. So the formula is actually good. The formula actually also works for us too. Uh, we just can't do it. The formula works for everything except the Klein bottle. Again, this formula is great. It works for absolutely everything. Um, so it, it's quite easy to see that you need at least four colors. So here's an example from Europe. So if you try to color Europe, and you think of it in maybe more in terms of a more symmetric graph, you will actually realize uh, that you need four colors, which is my picture here is, I guess, uh, yellow, orange, purple, and red. So you can't do better. That's an even simpler example. I just wanted to pull up a real map, a real world map. Uh, this example is certainly simpler. So everything touches everything, so you need, need uh, at least four colors. And here's another example that you need at least four colors. So uh, you can't color the, the United States with, with, with fewer colors. Uh, Nevada and Montana will play the party poopers here. Uh, always, always need, uh, sorry, Nevada will play the party poopers, Montana is fine. Uh, so uh, you will always need at least uh, four colors. So it's usually easy to see that you have a lower bound, and then it's kind of only the decision for the sphere whether it's four, five, or six, and it turns out that this decision is just really, really, really hard. Right. So let's do the torus. For the torus, it actually works pretty well. So uh, if you fit in the torus, we can do that again. What is the torus? All the characteristic of the torus is zero. So then the formula is very simple. It's seven plus square root of 49. I can do that. That's seven plus seven. Seven plus seven over two is, is seven. So the uh, maximum number of colors you actually should need for the torus is seven. Um, and it turns out that there is a map that does the job. So we get actually the quality. Let me show you two pictures of the map. I will zoom in in the map in a little bit. But it, essentially, there, there are the countries that run around and everything touches everything. Um, the nicer picture is maybe this one. Um, so on a torus, you can realize uh, this map here. So this is the torus. The green country is here. The light blue country is here. And everything touches everything. And it's like this hexagonal shape um, that you know from honeycombs and so on. So there's one hexagon that's surrounded by six hexagons, which gives us this magic number seven. So one hexagon 
surrounded by six hexagons. This is not a map you can realize uh, on the sphere, but you can realize it on the torus. Call it hexagons on the torus. So actually, um, something you could do in the torus. It's really the honeycomb picture. You have one hexagon in the middle, and around the hexagon you can see six hexagons, and everything touches everything because of the condition of a torus that if you enter, uh, exit to the left, you enter to the right, and if you exit to the north, you enter from the, from the south. So what does this actually show now for the, for the torus, for example? Well, we know that the number is at most seven, and we just found an example that needs seven, so we know the number is seven. And you can do the same for all the other funky surfaces. You can always find a map that realizes uh, that number. So, slightly more complicated picture on the projective plane. You can do something with six colors. Um, so again, because it's a projective plane, everything touches actually everything. So the bo border of my red country here is somewhere here. So red actually touches a green and orange as well. So everything touches everything. And you need uh, six colors to do it. It's always a bit tricky to find those. But the point is you just need to find one of them anyway. And you believe that the formula is true. So again, for the for P2, we get that the number is actually spot on. Um, uh, the correct one. The, the, only, the only surface I said again for which this doesn't work is S2, which is a kind of a very fun fact. It's the easiest surface and it doesn't work. Uh, so here everything touches everything. Let me try again here. So this purple region is clearly adjacent to this one, this one, and this one, but it also is adjacent to those two because it lives down here as well. So it also is adjacent to orange and blue. And if you check all the others, you can see. Everything touches everything. So, hence, we get the quality here. Next one, Klein bottle. And Klein bottle is kind of fun. So, for the Klein bottle, you need to work. Let's go back. So, the Klein bottle is the only exception where the formula doesn't work. So, the Klein bottle estimate is seven, but you actually only need six. You don't need to remember that. It's kind of a fun coincidence. The formula is important. That it fails for the Klein bottle is not so important. Um, but you can, of course, explicitly see that. Um, so here, so you need to prove now that the, the, the actually six suffices. That's not so hard. It's not so trivial. I won't do it. It was done in the 30s. And to construct something with six colors is, again, well, let's have a look at the Klein bottle. Again, everything should touch everything here. So uh, this one comes out here. This one comes out here in the Klein bottle picture. So let's see whether green touches everything. Green certainly touches those three. Green also touches this one. And um, because green comes out like this on the other side because of the twisted arrow, green also touches the orange one. And if you draw it really on the Klein bottle, I I'm not sure if you can see anything here. Uh, but if you draw it on a Klein bottle, it looks like this. So the point is those, this one here, oh, this was a bad color. This one here goes in here and comes out all the way from the tail, from the bottom again. So it actually touches this one, which is something you can't do on it. Similarly for the, for the dark blue one. It comes out through the tail of the Klein bottle and actually touches, for example, green. Again. Um, so this is the, the four color theorem. Let me just wrap up what we, and I don't do it, but you can write down uh, maps for any of the other surfaces so such that our Hebrew's estimate is actually spot on. It's always this number um, that you can, so that you can always use. So it's a really cool uh, statement. Just feed it in all our characteristics. And out, what comes out is, uh, the coloring number for maps on the surface. Very, very impressive. Back to the only thing that is missing, <laughs> kind of again, really fun fact, is the, the seemingly easiest case, uh, either the disk or I showed you last time that the, the same problem for either the disk. This is certainly not a, um, a, <laughs> a complex number C, that's, that's a, a normal C. So it's either the disk, R2, or S2. And they all have four, 
And uh, let me pull it up again in case you already forgot, because it's really impressive. It's the main, one of the main statements of all of mathematics, not just of this lecture, which I have no chance to prove. Yeah, let me just. Um, that, that's a nice way of formulating it. Uh, so essentially, there's a huge computer verification of uh, this theorem. And if I would really do it just in this lecture, we would be still be sitting here at the end of the universe. Uh, so let me let, just not do it. And it's a huge story behind it. It's um, it, it really, 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 really remarkable. You can use it. So I'm stating it so you can use it, but I can't prove it for you. It's just, and as I said, if, if we just do it together, uh, we will still be sitting here at the end of the universe. I don't know how you feel. Uh, that's a bit too long for me. Um, but anyway, you can certainly use it. What I will show, and that's what I will do next time, is that it can be called as five colors. That somehow is already, it, it's probably, it's a nice proof, but it's a long proof, so I will do it very, very slowly. It's one of the remarkable proofs that actually you can try to remember. It's a fancy version of a collapsing phase argument that we have already seen. And it shows you how big the step is from 6 to, so right now we know 6, so we verify 6 is an upper bound. I will verify 5 is an upper bound. And the step from 6 to 5 is, is, is quite big. It's essentially one, one large proof that I will do. And I feel like it's really a nice proof, so I will really want to show it to you. There will be zillions of pictures, so don't worry, but we don't do it today anymore. And so that's a huge step from 6 to 5, and the reduction from 5 to 4 is even, even, even larger. That, that's so huge that, um, well, all, all known proofs of the computational component is, is a very uh, kind of uh, nice way of phrasing it. It's just, it's just impossible to do, as far as we know by now. So maybe some, someone has a good idea how to do it. Um, I should warn you. It looks like, like a problem that you can just try yourself. I should warn you that there, this is one of the theorems in mathematics with the most known wrong proofs. So a lot of people tried and tried to get their proofs published. And almost all, all of them we know are actually not correct. It, 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 it's, it's a tricky one. So I, I wouldn't spend uh, my lifetime trying to prove it. It's remarkable, but tricky. So I will show you this step here. And the other step is just way beyond the scope of this lecture. Um, and we will prove the five colors theorem next time. It will take us a while. So we are roughly here now, as you can see. And the five color theorem is proven so, uh, somewhere down here. It will be done. So it will take us a while. Um, it's still loading. There are lots of pictures. Oh, this is already too far. All right, so next time, the only thing I will do is I will so here are the pictures already for the five color theorem. I will prove the five color theorem for you. Uh, for now, let me just recall what we did. There's the main, the main theorem, which I personally really like, if that, in case that wasn't clear. Um, sorry, the slides load quite a while. Too many pictures, I guess. So where are we almost? This one here, uh, which is a closed formula for all of the mapping coloring problems for all closed stuff. Thank you very much.